the podcast listeners, this is uh, an interview with John Thorne for the Twin Peaks Reflection section on my uh, on this podcast episode. And I would just advise anybody listening to this, you probably already know all about John. He's the founder of Wrapped in Plastic and now writes for Blue Rose Magazine. And uh, if you don't know that much about him, I would encourage you to go to the interviews I conducted with him. Uh, over a couple years. I think there's four separate interviews, and I'll link those in the show notes below. But briefly, do you want to give people, I think this is mostly going to be a conversation more between us rather than like sort of a formal interview, but to start off with, do you want to give them a kind of a sense of where you're coming from and your relationship to Twin Peaks in a nutshell? Uh, sure, yeah. I mean, uh, I was just telling my wife, I lived with Twin Peaks for over half my life. You know, when it came on in 1990, I was just a sudden and massive fan of the show uh, to the point where I started writing uh, about it and interviewing people about it quite extensively uh, with Craig Miller uh, for Wrapped in Plastic magazine, which is um, kind of now like a footnote in the history of Twin Peaks, uh, sort of... A, made some connection, I guess, uh, with, uh, with the history of Twin Peaks. Um, and so I wrote about, I've written about Twin Peaks a lot. I've thought about Twin Peaks a lot. Um, and, uh, like I said, I've interviewed many, many, many people connected with the show and the movie. And, and after Wrapped in Plastic ended, uh, years went by and now I'm doing it all again, I guess, uh, for the Blue Rose magazine with, uh, Scott Ryan uh, and I did collect a bunch of the stuff I did for Wrapped in Plastic into a book. So some people may know that, the essential Wrapped in Plastic, which is out there on Amazon. So um, I, I'm always thinking about Twin Peaks, so I'm happy to talk about it. During the, I guess it would be the mid-90s, late 90s, and early 2000s as well, you doing the, all these interviews with Twin Peaks cast and crew, and you were writing these essays, these analyses. And it seems like you guys were pretty, I mean, you had the community around the magazine, but it doesn't seem like there was a larger ecosystem of Twin Peaks at that time. And it feels like what we have now maybe started, I think you could argue it started around the gold box maybe in 2008. But uh, since 2014, when we, you know, sort of, not entirely coincidentally, I guess, but when yeah. we did those first interviews, there's just been an ongoing and ever-growing uh, community of Twin Peaks online where you have, you know, websites and podcasts and right. commentators that are, it's almost like a full-time, you know, sure. a full-time Twin Peaks thing. So. Can you, I, I don't, I'd actually be kind of interested. I mean, I guess we're still doing a little bit of an interview mode before we yeah, get no, to yeah. the more yeah. casual Go ahead. conversation. But now that we're talking about this, I'm kind of curious to hear your perspective on that time versus um, maybe not even this moment, the second, but like the that that period from when uh, the missing pieces was coming back, maybe even a little earlier, up to through the show and the aftermath and. Uh, yeah, know, the, the uh, contrast, yeah. what that's been like. Well, it's, yeah, I, I have thought about this a lot. I mean, and you're right. In the 90s and the early 2000s, um, there, was a, there was a pretty significant Twin Peaks fan base that kept in touch with one another. And we really kind of communicated in many ways through Wrapped in Plastic uh, and went to the Twin Peaks festivals. But it was pretty small. And, and part of the reason for that, I think a major reason for that, is that Twin Peaks was not accessible to people. You couldn't watch it. Um, yes, there were some DVDs out there that came a little later. In fact, I don't think the first DVD set came out until 2001. Um, I know that because I participated in an interview for that uh, that's on there as a special feature, and that was 2001. So the 90s there was no there was some video cassettes and but it you know there's no streaming services yeah they really i guess there were some websites uh, you know obviously there was an online presence of some sort but uh i think that limited the growth of the fan base because it was one of those things that you just really unless you knew someone or you had some access to a way to watch it you couldn't get into it and that changed you know, that changed once it finally broke through a lot of the legal things that were keeping it 
restricting if someone had rights to the pilot and someone had rights to the first season and you know whatever the, all that was. Finally, it, it got out there, uh, you know, on a home video format that was easier to access. And then, of course, it, it I think maybe it showed up on YouTube. It certainly showed up on Netflix, and people were able to stream it. Uh, and as you say, I think there was the growth of podcasts and and that kind of thing uh, that you know the, the social media came of age in that decade after two you know, after two thousand and and obviously you know the fan base grew from that and then of course uh, there was you know, the announcement that it was coming back but I think before the announcement the access to it became easier and so the fan community grew that was not the case in the 90s it just you know it, there was a barrier it was just so far you mm-hmm. could kind of go it was, it was hard it was hard to get into twin peaks it became easier later now would you say i mean obviously um there's many advantages to having you know, the uh the community and the infrastructure that that the twin peaks fandom has now do you find yourself sometimes sort of uh, nostalgic in any way, or <laughs> it just—it seems like there's a certain. And I wasn't—I knew nothing about Twin Peaks this period, so I missed out on it. So sort of looking back, but there's almost sort of like a poignant kind of like coziness to it, of like that little flame flickering in the darkness. <laughs> is no, there, it, you're is there a sense yeah, yeah. of that that you miss in any way. Um, to some extent, and I would just say that it would be a selfish thing in some ways. I mean, you know. Wrapped in Plastic was sort of... Wrapped in Plastic and the festival were the two things mm. uh, that were the center of the Twin Peaks fandom. And so, you know, we were we were the center of the Twin Peaks fandom uh, to some extent. And it, it felt like, you know, we almost... You know, I, I, I don't want to... I don't want to overstate it, but it was like, you know, we almost had ownership of it to some extent. Um, and, and you know, that was a nice feeling. I... I I'm not unhappy in any way that the fan yeah. has grown and uh, and spread. And, and, you know, there's so many people out there talking about it, and then there's so many podcasts and so many websites, and that, that is understandable and makes sense. And um, it's still a cult show, though. I mean, yes, in the 90s, it really, really was a limited number of, of people. A lot of people remembered it. It had a huge audience when it was on TV. That audience, you know, most of that audience went away, didn't, didn't, stay interested in it or follow it. There was a tiny segment of that original audience that was mm. extremely devoted to Twin Peaks. And it was that audience that you kind of connected with and you had your, you know, your, um, your fan base that was small, but devoted. Um, uh, and uh, that fan base certainly has certainly grown and diversified, I think, to some extent. And now, you know, there's a lot of people writing books and putting out theories and ideas and um so i'm i'm happy about that but it was it was it's hard to explain to someone who maybe wasn't there it was a it really was a unique thing if you were a twin peaks fan and um it was it was i guess cozy is a good word it was almost like everybody knew one another <laughs> yeah. to some extent i look through the letters pages of wrapped in plastic and i see you know, many letters from the same people over and over again because that was that was the fan base. You know, that was that fan, the ones that were willing to write letters. Um, now, of course, you're on Twitter. I mean, there's just millions of people who who will tweet about Twin Peaks. It's, it's a different thing now. Well, looking at it sort of from the other end of the of the spectrum, where do you think we are now in terms of uh, Twin Peaks as a as a fandom or culture or whatever? Now that the show is over a year in the past, and there's nothing necessarily, although there could be, but there's nothing necessarily on the horizon. That's a good question. I I, I think there, we're still feeling the aftershocks to some extent yeah. of season three. I think there were a lot of people very unhappy with it, and we know this. This is this is a fact. There were a lot of hardcore fans, some of whom I could name, some of whom are good friends of mine who were unhappy or disappointed or angry with what happened. And they've kind of left the fold to some extent, um, which is, I think, a real shame and tragedy and, and 
because these were these were those people from the '90s to some extent, um, and they're and they're just they, they were disappointed by it. Uh, on the other hand, there are other people who are just so enthused and invigorated by it. I would call myself one of those people um, uh, who think that it you know that this was. Um, this Twin Peaks season three was not a continuation of the original. This was it, it, this was something else, and I I don't want to say it was a reboot. It's not a reboot. I don't want to. There's no term really I can place around it. This was the Twin Peaks of Mark Frost and David Lynch's mind 25 years later, based on the plot lines and ideas they had put into play 25 years ago, and then picked up again and dealt with, with a different mindset and a different goal, I think. And it functioned differently than just a continuation. And I find that personally very rewarding. It, 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 I changed in the decades between seasons. They changed and the show changed. And I guess I embrace it as being something that was an evolution of, you know, uh, something that came before. Um, I'm not putting it into the best words, but I, you know, I think, I think it evolved. It was a different thing, um, but it couldn't have existed without that original. And I think some fans were more open to it than others. Uh, and right now I think people are still kind of ra- trying to wrap their heads around it. Some people are, you know, knocking their heads against walls, trying to solve it, which I don't think they can. Uh, and when I say solve it, I mean come up with just a satisfactory, clean explanation for why all these things happened in the way they happened. Uh, and other people are are just sort of open to you know the flow of it, um, the, the stream of consciousness of, stre- of season three. Uh, and then I think maybe I'm somewhere in between. Um, mm-hmm. I think it has a lot to offer and it opens up, you know, has really concrete ideas in it. And yet it is something that is impossible to uh, put a boundary, to put a perimeter around. So um, I think people will be talking about it for many, many years to come. New audiences will come to it and it will continue to evolve. It'll be something else maybe 15 years, 20 years from now. Um, so anyway, it's a long answer, but I think it's a great question, and I really believe that it's the the work of art that is Twin Peaks. The whole thing is a living thing, and as as time goes along, it changes. And that may sound really kind of new agey, but I think it's true. And I think as the audience ages and and matures, um, it it means different things to that audience as time progresses. So it means something different to me now than it would to someone who's coming into it, who may be 25 years old and is watching it for the first time. They're going to see it and get something out of it. Um, Different than I get out of it now as someone who's 25 years older than that. (laughs) So uh, I don't know if that means anything, Joel, but there it is. There it is. No, definitely. <laughs> it actually kind of makes me think, talking about how the work changes in... I mean, it's not only a different Twin Peaks, but it can potentially make you look at the original Twin Peaks differently as well, yes. which Twin Peaks has always done. And um, I guess a couple of questions spring out of that. One, just to cut to the chase, I guess, is do you, where are you at in your musings or wondering or thinking that that if there's going to be more Twin Peaks? Uh, I, uh, well, I have said, you know, there's never going to be Twin Peaks again and been proven wrong. Um, (laughs) Right. (laughs) uh, So I I honestly can't say, no, there's not going to be Twin Peaks. I mean, who knows what will happen? I mean, mean, David Lynch might wake up tomorrow morning and say, I've I've got a film idea. I've got to do it. And it's just going to be, you know, Diane and, and that's going to be it. Laura Dern comes over Mm -hmm. to the house and they, and they make a movie. Um, uh, but as for it being a major project with a big cast on television, again, Mm -hmm. I think it's highly unlikely. And I think just because of the practicalities of it, I, I think Lynch, Lynch is just, you know, 
he's probably too old to do it. And I don't mean he's not capable. I just think taking on something that would be another season of the show, I think for both Lynch and Frost might just be too daunting. And I also believe that they both basically said what they wanted to say in season three, whether we are happy with that or agree with that or, you know, feel that they succeeded or failed, they did what they wanted. And um, it has, I think, a definitiveness to it, the way it ends, even though it's completely ambiguous and open. <laughs> so, so with that long answer, I will say, no, I don't think there's going to be a season four. That's an interesting answer because I was going to say, well, I think I disagree. I think there is going to be more, but actually I kind of agree because I think I, I just have a, I have a sense that the story is not done. And by that, I don't mean that Lynch is necessarily planning anything now. I'm basically saying, I think, which is a sort of a ridiculous thing to say, uh, you know, depending on your philosophy, but I, I feel like the universe, the, the arc of the universe is bending toward more there being more Twin Peaks and, and him waking up one day and wanting to continue it, <laughs> which anything yeah, no, can happen in the interim. Sure. So that's yeah, a I mean, weird it, prediction to make, but it feels like <laughs> there's – it just feels like, uh, I don't know. I I think – I mean, I, what you say, you know, is so true. I mean, he could easily get some spark and say, I've got to do it. I mean, like he can't help it. He has to, he has to return to the world of Twin Peaks. Um, but it won't be a see. It will not be another sprawling ensemble no. piece with a bunch of different no. subplots for 18 hours on Showtime. No. Once no, no. a week I, I, for a summer. That's my, yeah. Oh no. I think There's it could just, be on Showtime, but I think it'll be more in a movie form. Uh, I mean, if you want, small, you know, if you want limited series type thing, and it won't be. I don't think it would be an ensemble piece. I think it would be the fire right. walk with me to season exactly. three's uh, season one, season sure. two to make it confusing. <laughs> no, 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 that's exactly. No, you make that. You make a good point. I was going to say that there would be a symmetry to it. Yeah. Um, if exactly. there was a film, a two-hour film that came along that, uh, you know, connected in some way, tangentially, you know, in some oblique way to season three that, like Fire Walk With Me, didn't really give us any resolution to season one, two storyline, and yet it embellished it and enhanced it and, and, and in some ways altered it. Um, I think there's the chance that a two-hour film, as Lynch had this idea, would come along where it would connect in some unusual way with season three and make us start thinking in ways we, we aren't right now, but not take place, you know, on the street outside the Palmer home with agent Cooper, uh, standing there, uh, you know, uncertain and bereft, you know, of what, uh -huh. what is happening. I don't, I think that ending is going to stay and that's going to be the new Cooper looks in the mirror ending, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, and I don't think there's anyone else. I mean, I, it's not going to be a franchise. It's not going to be like some other artist is going to come along somewhere down the road and say, okay, I can, you know, I can take on Twin Peaks. That, that's impossible. Uh, you know, once Lynch and Frost are, are no longer with us or no longer creating, there is no more Twin Peaks. Um, so I think, you know, I think that ending with Cooper on the street, which isn't technically the last shot. The last shot is Laura whispering in Cooper's ear, um, that's the ending. I mean, that that's what we've got to live with <laughs> for yeah, forever. That's the part I'm not sure about. 